Kako hat's gefällt mir nicht, Kako hat's geit man, weil Kotzk ist doch beim Koim am Mikdesch, Kotzk ist doch beim Koim am Mikdesch, Kako hat's gedauft man, Eule Regel san, Eule Regel san, Regel ist doch der Teitschafis. My name is Jane Guberman. Today is Thursday, December 22nd, 2016. I'm here with David Roskies at his home in New York City, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. David, do I have your permission to record this interview? Absolutely. The Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project consists of 25 interviews and corresponding transcripts that were some of the earliest and most influential in the movement. All three were based in different cities, Boston, New York City, and Washington, D.C. Despite being in different locations, they shared many recurring themes and promoted change in line with the social and political fervor of the era. The nature of the times allowed these communities to explore Judaism under a new progressive lens. This allowed their relationships with their faith to be intimate and personal, much different from the large, comparably impersonal services that were commonly held during this time. There are 13 interviews from Havarat Shalom. Mona and Michael Fishbane, Art Green, Michael Strassfeld, Sharon Strassfeld, Barry Holtz, Everett and Mary Gendler, Joel Rosenberg, Joseph and Gail Reamer, David Roskies, Stefan and Mary Krieger, Bella and George Saverin, Michael Paley, and Richard Siegel. The New York Havara has seven interviews. Phyllis Sperling, Judith Plaskow and Martha Ecclesberg, John Risquet, Alan Mintz, Gerald Sirota, Leslie and Zev Schenken, and Robert Goldenberg. And from Fabrengen, there are five interviews. Hava Weisler, Arthur Waskow, David Schneer, Rob Agus, and George Johnson. To use these interviews, you can go through the transcript and search for keywords that correlate with your interests, or you could watch the interviews and learn from that. The Havras were all based around the idea of community, but each had concentrations that emerged as a result of who was involved. Art Green, notably seen as one of the founders of Havarat Shalom, knew of this distinction between the Havras. The way we talked about it in those days was there were three groups. There was Jews for Urban Justice in Washington, there was Boston Chavarat Shalom, and there was New York Chavara. The Washington people were the political ones. That was founded by, I don't remember, Arthur Wasco came in second, but they were, they were very political from the beginning. We were the spiritual Chavara, and the New York called themselves the social ones. They were really interested in creating this group and creating a group feeling and group dynamic, and that was their, that was their main thing. And then they became political around Burt Weiss and Murray Pomerantz and draft resistance. They were sort of pulled into the political. But I don't think they started as political. I think they really started as a kind of Jewish countercultural social group. That's my, my impression. And I remember we used to use those three designations. The Washington people are political, we're the spiritual, and the New Yorker the social. And social was not a put-down word. It was a sort of, that's what they... The Havaraz also had a large impact on Jewish feminism which took root in the progressive environment provided by the communities. They were all gender inclusive, which allowed women to learn skills that had been previously unavailable to them. Uh, until that point, it's, it sounded from what you said that it was quite egalitarian from the, from the get-go. Women were counted in the minion from the get-go, and those women who had skills, which were a smaller percentage than the men, could lead Torah discussions, um, lead davening, read from the Torah when we started to do all those things, mm -hmm. teach classes. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember the first time you actually read Torah? Yeah, I do. I wrote a poem about it, um, which I probably ought to be able to retrieve for you. Um, but that is, I did read, learn by rote to read the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Um, and I did from that early on uh, from, right. from a friend who made a tape for me. Right. And of course the Rosh Hashanah trope is different and I still read that sometime. Havarat Shalom was the first Havara established and their egalitarianism developed as they encountered conflicts. And if you want, I can tell you the story of how women became, became accept, became equal a lot I can tell you now, I guess it sort of fits. If sure. You want. So it was our first year retreat. So it was probably, I think it was the first year, it was Sukkot, I think, retreat. We were out in so some right retreat center. I believe so. It could have been the second year, but I'm pretty sure it was the first year. 
I, I may be wrong about this. And we were on retreat. And uh, for Shachrit, we were up, some, some of us were up early. There were 10 of us, nine men and me. And I, no one was thinking, you know, oh, we would arm a minion or anything like that. And then somebody, one of the, our, our members was, I think Epi, it was Epi, Epi, and he was and, the one he grew up with. Adults. And someone said, "Oh, we can't, we can't, Epi can't say Kaddish. There isn't a minion." So I counted noses and I said, "Why? There's ten people here." And I wasn't being provocative. Remember, I grew up in a feminist household. I mean, I granted that feminism hadn't hit Judaism yet in my world or anybody else's world, but I just here we were. I mean, we were equal people, and I was a player. I wasn't, you know, I hadn't been applied, applied and gone to, gotten admitted or whatever. But I, you know, I was very much a part of the community. So, and people were like, oh. <laughs> and then someone said, well, let's ask, Epi gets to decide whether he can say Kaddish with, with, you know, nine men and a woman. And Epi said, fine. Was it immediate? Yeah. I think so. And yeah. then... In many, I, other, and then, many other cases, we subsequently studied the halakhic sources, but in this case, it we was... We didn't study the sources. For other things, but in this case, we needed to make a decision... And it didn't come from ideologically, it just came because there were 10 people there. And then from that, pretty much from that day forward, we were egalitarian. There are many more themes in these interviews that you can explore, but at the core was always the idea of community. We were just also young people in search of some kind of new intensity new passionate intensity. And the passionate intensity was certainly about building a better world and about stopping the war. But it was also about how people saw one another in a true way. And that meant looking deeply into each other and getting to know each other. And that meant that included being silent together and not filling up the world, the empty space with a wall of words, as we would say. Um, and, so, and so that intensity that we experienced in niggin singing together and in being silent in the prayer room together and in being silent around the table together was all prior to whatever specific content from the Jewish mystical tradition might come into it. It was that was part of that was part of the culture, the broader culture, but our particular communal culture. Havarat Shalom, the New York Havara, and for bringing in all redefined Judaism and continue to have lasting impact today. And what would you say have been the Havara's most important contributions and, and, and largest sort of spheres of impact? Hmm. Impact? Mm -hmm. Changing the way people think about Judaism. That's big. You know, um, that organized Jewish expression isn't the only way to be Jewish. And I think it's had a profound effect on, on uh, um, Jews throughout the country, Jews in synagogues throughout the country. <laughs> Shamu <laughs> Rizafu,